One thing I've never been great at, <laughs> contrary to how it looks right now, is I've never been great at resting, taking it easy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny, you know, like lots of people, when they start out in the arts and they start practicing, they, they really struggle with establishing a, a regular practice, like a practice they can do all of the time. They end up finding procrastination or they just want to sit around or, or something like this. But for me, it was the other way. I, I guess because I started young, when I was a kid, it was just, you know, you just follow along with what you're told. And I was told to follow this kind of arduous timetable of training. And, and then that, I guess that, that served my purposes in a way, you know, gave me discipline and lots of hours put into the practice, taught me the meaning of hard work and stuff like that. But it, it also became counterproductive because in the end, I, I developed an inability to rest. I just couldn't take it easy. So it was train, 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 train. And then when I wasn't training, it was study, study, study around that what I was training. And then when I wasn't studying or around the subject related to my training, then I got to a certain age, it became teach. And, and then body conditioning got added and blah, 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 just so many different things. And, and then running Lotus Ne Gong is, is a lot of work. People don't, I don't think people know that. I, I don't get to spend all this time in hammocks. <laughs> in fact, it's very rare. Most of the time I'm training or teaching or studying or in traveling to see teachers or, or working on the organization itself. So I've had to learn to rest, you know. And it's a funny thing because resting isn't just with the body but has to be with the mind as well, which is the tricky thing, isn't it? Because I don't believe meditation is rest, for example. I really don't. I don't think meditation is resting. I think it's a different kind of tiring. I think that um, sort of daily activity takes away what should we say, like your physical energy, so you need to rest your physical body. And thinking, there's your mental energy, isn't it? And of course, they cross over with one another, the physical and mental energy, but then meditation is almost like another kind of energy. I don't know what you'd call it, like a spiritual energy, I don't know. But it's definitely quite taxing in a way. And one way that becomes really clear is when you enter into states, shall we say, even though that's not a great word, is it, like a state? Because a state implies just an experience, and an experience is pointless. But when you say you enter into meditation proper, when you go into it, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a state, a stillness that you, that you move into, a union really. I don't like the word stillness because people overlay their own meanings on top of it. I don't like stillness or emptiness. I think they're terrible terms. But people enter into union in meditation and go into the sort of jhana or, or whatever from different traditions. And then you stay there ultimately for a certain degree of amount of time. Usually time kind of freezes, body goes into stasis, you lose track of kind of <laughs> sense of how long you've been sat there. And sometimes those times can extend out for really long times. But ultimately it burns up energy. It burns up an energy because what happens is it's like a little life bar on your video game character or a rechargeable battery. Once that energy runs out, you get catapulted or sort of fired like a slingshot out of that state. That's what happens so that you return to how you were before you meditate. And so you come out, so time comes back. And for years I couldn't figure out, what, what is it? What was it? Is it just, why am I getting taken out of this state? Is it because I'm suddenly thinking? Can my mind not stay in the state of unification for, for very long? What is it? Why did it start at five minutes, then hit 15, then hit 30, and then hover there for a long time, and then kind of extend out? But ultimately, why, why do you get thrown out of those states? And then I came to realize, or sort of understand from looking at my own system and my own body and also the systems of other people who are practitioners is that it also burns up an energy it burns up a kind of chi and once that chi burns out then you're catapulted out of that state so meditation is incredibly tiring on some levels rejuvenating because of the relaxation perhaps for lots of people but to enter into the meditative state can really burn you out and it's often, I think, why you practice meditation and you do your sitting practice and then it's really good one day and then the next day it's terrible. <laughs> and then the day after that it's terrible. And oh, it's just awful. And then it takes a little while to come back. You get this kind of peaks and troughs. And I'm talking again about meditation proper, not relaxation, right? So to me, it's because it burns up a kind of energy. It's not really rest. It's not rest. <laughs> it's, it's a different kind of rest. It's resting for the body. Maybe resting for the mind. I'm going to try and do that without falling out of this hammock like an idiot. Um, but it's not, it's not full rest. Sleep is not full rest because for most people, they're still very mentally active. The dreams, the hun is active, the mind is doing things. So it's still not full rest. Full rest is tricky. 
So if sleep isn't rest. Watching TV is not rest, obviously. Mental activity rests in the body. And in some ways, it creates a kind of disconnect because if you've got a lot of mental activity and no physical activity, that can actually be more draining. It creates a kind of disconnect between the two. So you've got sort of inadequate rest when you watch TV, inadequate rest when you sleep, inadequate rest when you meditate. <laughs> it becomes difficult. How do you rest? And this, <laughs> this is what happened, was I almost ended up sort of shouting at frustration of myself and, and of my teachers as well for saying that I needed to rest more. And, and I couldn't figure out what rest was. And then, you know, this will sound obvious when I say it, but then you come to realize that ultimately that what is rest? Rest is when the mind, to me, resides in the body. That's what it is. That's what rest is. So some people who are very spiritually minded wouldn't like that because they say, oh, the mind and the body are not you and they're just fragments, they're layers. And yeah, sure, okay, but I'm talking about resting, physical body, resting mentally. That's what I'm discussing, right? I want to rest them, fully rest, because I can get some rest when I sleep, you know? I can get some rest when I meditate. I can get some rest when I do Qigong. I can get, yeah, you know, some rest when I sit on the couch, but not, not fully. Like, how do I rest properly? And ultimately, I learned that, excuse me, mm, lime. Lime is good when you're in the hammock. So, ultimately, I learned that resting was when the mind and the body are with one another. So all of that attention that I'm talking about, instead of intention, it's really the key to relaxation. That's how you learn to relax, or that's a method that you learn to relax. Because if I take my mind and I place it in my body and there's lots of mental activity, it's not resting, it's tiring. It ties you out. It's essentially overlaying. It overlays your mental tiredness <laughs> onto your physical body or your mental activity onto your physical body. So if I'm all over the place, ah, what is this going on? My life is a mess. Everything is chaos. And then I listen inside my body. My mind is already tired. My mind is already in a stressed out state. And now when I put my mind in the body, now my body becomes tired and my body becomes stressed as well. And this to me is a lot of the root of why some people, or many people I think, can start um, internal training and find it just tires them out. You know, it's like, oh, I went to this Qigong class, I went to this Nagon class, went to this meditation class, Tai Chi, yoga, I don't know, whatever it is people are doing. And I, I came for energy, but I was so tired. I just got drained. I just got exhausted. And that's what it is. It's because they're taking a stressed out, active mind that's tired and putting it in the body. And then it just overlays that quality onto the body. It, 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 your mind was already tiring the body out anyway, but now you've just amplified it by combining the two. And then you've got the other issue, isn't it, where the mind is outside of the body, always running around, looking at different things, chasing after the kids, chasing after the career, chasing after the problems at work, the problems in your life. You know, that's a separation between mind and body. So ultimately what happens is the mind gets tired, then the body gets tired, because often because of the physical activity. But even the disconnect between the two creates another kind of exhaustion. And I think this tiredness this disconnect between the mind and the body, because the mind is always out, it's not even just a physical tiredness, it's not a mental tiredness, it's something else, isn't it? It's like a, I guess, energetic tiredness. It's like the chi that holds the body and the mind together is dispersed by the lack of connection between the two. So I think that's the root for a lot of the kind of what we call burnout. I know there's physical reasons for it, of course, for something like burnout we can find, but I think the energetic reason is, is that it's a stressed out mind stressed out body that are separate from one another. So it becomes burnt out. It's like the chi just disperses. And if you ask the, the description of that burnout to of people, like, what does it feel like? It's hard for them to describe. They say, it's like, I've had it in the past, you know, a few times when I was writing books and organizing this, doing university degrees and running Lotus thing on, blah, 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 jet lag. But it's, it's a weird tiredness where the body gets warm. It's like an uncomfortable heat in the muscles to me. And then you just can't find energy and there's like a lethargy. You can't force through it. It's like a sort of chronic fatigue, but in shorter bursts, I guess, that kind of thing. Head's muggy, brain's muggy, body has no power, muscles can't contract. It's a real um, strange kind of tiredness. So I think you've got to these two different kinds, right? You've got the kind of tiredness where the stressed mind goes in the body and stresses the body out. <laughs> and then you've got the stressed mind that's not in the body, creates that kind of energetic tiredness. I think there's that. Then there's physical tiredness, of course, where the body is just overworked. 
because we have to realize that the body, when it, as any sort of gym goer will tell you, the body grows or changes at rest. It doesn't grow when you're in the gym, really. You stress the body out, and then at rest, it, it regrows. And there's, in some ways, you need more rest than you need exercise for that kind of extreme physical training. Although you probably shouldn't say that to people, because most people are too lazy with their bodies, as I am <laughs> demonstrating in a hypocritical fashion right now. Um, so there's body tiredness, of course, as well as, and there's kind of physical, but that, I think body tiredness often manifests, first of all, as some of the organs will go wrong, especially the spleen, doesn't it? Like when the body is tired, more than the kidneys, I think, first of all, the spleen goes. So spleen chi deficiency becomes quite prevalent. People get loose bowels and inability to think clearly and think that's body tiredness. And then it starts to hit the liver, which means the tendons become tight. So then people start injuring themselves and they become clumsy and uh, sort of frayed at the tendons, more like to snap themselves brittle. So there's that kind of tiredness. Then there's the other tiredness of dreams. People are always imagining things, lost in their imagination, away in the clouds. That creates a kind of tiredness too. And then uh, dreams themselves, you know, I mean, that's a disconnect between mind and body, isn't it? Your, your mind, <laughs> your soul even, doesn't even know that the body exists at that stage. So when do you rest? It's like all of those things are just different kinds of exhaustion. So where do you get your energy back? Well, it almost feels like <laughs> a lot of people are resting their body when they sleep, but not their mind. And then they rest in their mind when they're distracted, which means by the TV or something, means they rest in part of their mind, but not the other part of their mind. And then maybe if they have a meditation practice, they're, they're resting in the body and the mind, but not the energy. It's, you know, so you end up, or, or for me, I can only talk for me, if you look at all those different things, if I had a whiteboard, I could list them for you. You know, it'd be easier to see because this might sound a bit vague, but this is a very specific list to me. But what I was doing is I was never really tired. I was, uh, resting, sorry. I was just resting different parts of me <laughs> at different times. So something was always tired and something was always playing catch up. Either the body, the mind, or the soul, or the energy, or whatever. Something was tired, you know. And I think a lot of people live like that all the time. I think most humans do. And we eat some food for energy and we rest bits when we can. It's almost like a bird. That's those sort of long-legged aquatic birds, storks, herons. I don't know what they are. Flamingos. No idea. And when they, they rest one leg at a time, don't they? <laughs> so they stand on their left leg with their left leg, with the right leg tucked up under a wing. So they rest the left leg, then they switch legs and rest the other side. So they're never fully resting, they're resting part at a time. And I think that's what humans are doing. So then I came to realize that the, the way, certainly for me, that rested the most wasn't reading, wasn't swi switching off in my mind, wasn't meditation, wasn't longer sleep. It was really just a passive mind within the body. That's it. To take the body to still, to put the body in a still state that is still structured. This is not a good resting position, not really for me, not if I want to get the most out of it. A good resting position, position for me is either laying down or sitting up in a sort of standard seated practice posture or, or laying down, you know. So the body is there and then the mind is just applied through the body with pure attention, just listening. I don't need to go into that because if you're in the academy, <laughs> you're sick to death of me talking about the nature of <laughs> attention, I'm sure. But if the mind is just purely passive and listening and anchored into the body, not the breath, anchored into the body, the whole form from fingers to toes, tops of their head right down to the bottom of where you, bottom of your foot, you know, the whole form so that if I could lift my mind out, it was the same shape as my body. It's just in my body, just listening, paying attention. As soon as the mind leads, it ties you out. It's not proper resting. And if there's any mental stress, then that's going to tie the body out as well. So essentially, the mind has to go to a passive, neutral, calm, listening state, just paying attention to the body. And essentially, I learned that once I could do that quite well, that was how I could rest. And then within 20 minutes, 30 minutes of a sit, if you like, like that, would be the equivalent of a really deep night's sleep or, or something. I didn't replace my sleep because I think you need that for, the, for like pure body rest, even though the mind is still off doing things in many cases. But for pure sort of pure rest, that's the closest I could come really. It was the mind inside the body. And then really, if you look at how alchemy, Taoism, Negong, all these different arts work, they always ask you to do the same, don't they? You do a process and then you put your mind into the body. 
so maybe I'm working on the Dantienne or I'm working on releasing this or working on opening that, whatever it is, whatever the process. Afterwards, the mind just goes into the body and pays attention. What are you doing? You're resting. You're resting as much as anything else, or you're trying to. First, you can't because you carry your intention across. <laughs> so you're not resting. You just tie yourself out. But then when the mind is not carrying that intent and it's attentive, it is purely listening, purely passive in the way that it's paying attention to the body, then that's when, that's when the rest takes place, you know. You've unified mind and body. The energy is drawn into the body. Neither the mind, the body, or the energy are disturbed. So there's unification of all three and of stilling of all three. That's when they rest. And at that stage, that's when really the process grows. So I've known people who do something like, for example, try to form and fill the Dantian. Whatever, you can take any process. And they can try and form and fill the Dantian for 20 years, 30 years. And they still struggle, you know. And then sometimes you either teach them or they find it or they cotton onto it themselves. This idea of unifying the mind, the body, and the energy through attentive listening. So all three are in one location, not spread out, not all over the place. And as soon as they learn to do that, then all of a sudden, all of their other work just works. All their practice works. Because now they've gone from doing to resting. And as soon as they rest, the rest allows the doing to unfold within the body. Because ultimately, the fruits of your labor are only ever experienced when you're resting. It's really what it comes down to. So can we... You know, so I hope you understand that's a major thing, you know, learning to attentively rest. So what do I do with almost all practices I teach? We do something, then you just sit and listen. Sit and listen. Listen to what? The body. Do I do anything? No. <laughs> that's the rest. It's not even passively switching off. That's not resting, is it? It's unification of mind, body, and energy, all in an attentive, neutral state. Now, the question would be, could you rest on something higher? Rest on spirit, rest on soul. And for me, or, or whatever, whatever people want to talk about, true self, blah, blah, blah. For me, the jury's out. Because whilst I think there is a truth in it, you can. You can rest in something higher. What I almost see universally in the people that rest, that I spend time out in those kind of higher states, something else suffers. It's a bit like dreaming, you know? Like <laughs> the body is resting while you're asleep and not necessarily the mind, or or whatever you're doing, it's the same with that higher-ended practice. When I rest in those higher states, the body doesn't always seem to rest. Not really. So what do you see? You see the body kind of burn out. I've met lots of very high-level spiritual practitioners who can reside in those deeper states of consciousness, but their body is fucked. It's overweight, it's swollen, it's tight, it doesn't move properly, it's broken. <laughs> The organs are shutting down, they've got blood problems, they've got diabetes, the spleen's not working, like all these different things. Just because the body is exhausted. The body is exhausted. And I think residing in those higher spiritual states are just too far from the body. They're too far. It's almost like too, too many steps away, so the body can't catch up. So, is that a hard and fast rule for all? No. No, there's exceptions, of course, but... It's definitely the, the norm amongst spiritual practitioners. And I think actually those ones that do manage to rejuvenate the body as well as the energy, as well as the mind, all three, I think they actually don't spend as much time residing in those higher states as people might think. I, my belief, my, um, <laughs> my, my understanding that I'm working to at the moment, my current understanding, is that this is where their rest comes from, is the mind and the energy and the body residing in one place attentively just listening to one another so that they can rest and, and build. It's the quickest way to build chi, as much as anything. You need the mechanism behind it, that's your doing, and then you need the resting, the non-doing, in order for that, that mechanism to carry out its, its work. And I think they spend a lot of time doing this. And when I, teachers I had pointed to it, you know, because I would say to them, oh, I'm just getting, you know, because of course you go to your teachers and you moan, don't you, about, how inefficient you are. <laughs> you said lots of people I teach moan to be about how inefficient they are and how useless they are at their practice, and which isn't true. You know, it's just the struggle we all go through. And then I go to my teacher and moan about how inefficient I am at what I do. <laughs> I'm a loser because I can't do this and I can't do that. And uh, you know, of course, the advice I just get back is you need to rest. So like, oh, how do I rest? And then of course that would always come with the advice: sit and breathe. And that's really what they meant. 
for a long time I misunderstood. I thought, oh, you meant we'll just sit, breathe oxygen into the body or sit and listen to my breath. But no, they, they just mean sit and be natural. <laughs> Let the body breathe. Pay attention to the body. Listen to the body. Let the body rest. Everything will come together. If you can do this, your energy will revitalize. The body will fix. And uh, you'll be surprised what it can do for your health and for even chronic conditions. It's quite powerful, very powerful. Just because, as I say, we're never fully resting. We're resting one part at a time. And I wish a lot of spiritual practitioners could hear this because there's a lot of people chasing high-minded concepts and every day, oh, I'm here, I'm in this mental state, I'm in that mental state, I'm in the heaven realms, I'm communicating with this, I found the alchemy pill or whatever. But their health is terrible, their mental health is terrible, their physical health is terrible, their nerves are frayed, they're falling to bits, they look a state, they don't know how to rest. And they don't understand that those spiritual states aren't bringing rest. It's just burning up a different kind of energy, you know? So I don't know. That's my thoughts on rest where I'm lazily sitting here in a hammock, <laughs> which I might spend the rest of the afternoon here. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see. Thanks, guys.